Hi, Grant. Good morning. How are you? And uh, how's the weather in the, the Caribbean this morning? It's beautiful. It's it's warm <laughs> as as usual. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time since I've been there, but uh, what a gorgeous place! Uh, I wish I could uh, be doing this live, but uh, yeah. I mean, with you, um, mm. you and I, it seems to me, have a couple of uh, of big common interests. Uh, mm -hmm. One is the musical world and the other being the philosophical world. And I have got a, a whole cadre of questions to ask you on both topics, if it's OK with you. Um, and especially the the crossover between music and philosophy is just about the best, you know, best thing for me. And I'm going to go ahead and, and recommend this book, um, which I thoroughly have enjoyed you see it? How does it feel? Um, the philosophy of music. And um, in reading about your descriptions of uh, Elvis and Bob Dylan and, and the Beatles and others, um, these are things that I think about <laughs> and, I, and I think that other people think about too. But you've, you've brought up a few things that I haven't thought about um, mm -hmm. so much. And I wanted to just uh, pick your brain on a couple of these topics. Sure. Uh, the first one being the concept that Elvis was sort of like a, a bridge between what you describe as like the, you know, the square culture that came before as mm -hmm. it maybe is exemplified by someone like Bill Haley who sang a rock around the clock, which was a, which is a great song, but it's not quite like modern rock as we know it. Mm -hmm. And, and you describe, I think accurately Elvis's passion and authenticity as being like a liberating spark that sort of like ignited this whole tinderbox of, of culture and, and music in, in the United States and then around the world. And people obviously, I mean, adored it is, is even the wrong word. They like, they went nuts over it. Mm -hmm. um, here's my, here's my philosophical question is, are there tangible benefits that we can point to as a result of this? Um, Yes, it was awesome and, and people loved it and it changed culture, but was it good? And and if so, how? Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, what I say in the book, which is called, How Does It Feel? It's this question from, but you know, the, core, the first line of the chorus of uh, Bob Dylan's Like a Rolling Stone. Um, that's the primary question of rock and roll. And Elvis answered this question um, by focusing almost exclusively on, on feeling, on bodily feeling, which is, you know, we, we call it affect, which is it's bodily feeling, it's intimations, it's various, various um, sensations. But he, he focused almost exclusively on that um, domain of being. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he, he, he wasn't a songwriter, so he was, he was, you know, covering other people's songs. And his his great genius was being able to to have some some um, affective sense of what um, his audience was was projecting in his direction and mm -hmm. and 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 engaging with that that affective wave that was directed toward him and and riding that wave instead of being crushed by it and he was he was he's the, still the great genius of of uh, just in small gestures and um, movements and of course his, his singing and his dancing um, and his facial facial expressions um, of, of of understanding how to reflect the the audience back at themselves and uh -huh. and understand and understanding how to create a an energetic resonance that that lifted the entire um, process out of that sort of um, rationalized, normalized post-war order. I mean, this is we're still, you know, I think we're still coming out of, um, you know, the wake of the Enlightenment and then the wake of the Victorian era and the wake of um, of of positivism and science and the 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 almost exclusive privileging. Of of rational um, intellectual uh, mentality, mm -hmm. and so and so what Elvis did. I mean, you know, and uh, there were certainly many precursors who did did similar things in jazz and in, yes. in blues, um, and you know, 
but it, particularly I think in, in American music. Um, but what what Elvis did is he he created um, a sort of a central a central node or a lightning rod or a catalyst for uh, the expression of affect um, on a collective scale. For sure, I I agree, and that's that seems apparent that he did. Um, let me let me try to like hone it a little bit more. Um, I had like a discussion with a friend a number a number of years ago, and he was considering moving out to Seattle to be um, to work for a major apparel company, mm -hmm. and but he was like struggling with it whether it was a good idea to uproot his family and you know um, and make this big move, and so I'm asking him like, well, what do you see? You know, what are what are the benefits? You know, and he was like, I think it's exciting to you know be able to take a product and to make it better, you know, and more appealing to the masses and, you know, to, uh, to, to affect culture in that way. And I was, and I would say, I said, that's, that's great, you know, and, and I, but I pointed out to him that Starbucks, you know, maybe perfected coffee, you know, on a mass scale and, and mm -hmm. Apple maybe brought music to people and, you know, other, other, and, communications to people in an incredible fashion, but you have tons of people who are sitting in Starbucks on their phones, thoroughly unhappy, if you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. so, my, so my question is, can you pinpoint something within Elvis's music or within music in general, that once the trend has been ignited, you know, once, wh whatever it is, whether it's jazz or R&B or rap or, or, or rock and roll, Yes, it happened and it was important, you know, culturally, but was it good? Like, did it change? Did it, did it add, was it additive? And if so, how? Well, so, so I think that, that it allowed us to, to have access to other modes of relation and other modes of existence that had been repressed and disqualified um, as other in the privileging of rationality. And actually, I think uh, this 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 brings us to what I, I actually thought we were going to be talking about today, which is uh, which Spinoza. Is Spinoza. Yes, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get okay, there. Okay. But, it, <laughs> but it, it actually brings us there, which is that um, uh, so so Spinoza is is you know sort of the the theorist who initiated the philosopher who in, initiated the um, the theory of affects of of the bodily yeah. emotions for the modern yes. era, and he was writing in the 17th century. He wrote. The ethics. He was, you know, um, from from Amsterdam. Uh, was expelled from the Jewish community there when he was 23 years old, and um, worked as a as a lens grinder as he wrote these great these great books. Um, and the ethics, of course, wasn't published until after his his death. But but what he does after in the wake of Descartes, who's sort of like his primary his primary precursor, is he, Descartes is famous for for sort of um, sundering um, mind and world into the, the mind-body dualism. And what Spinoza did is he reintegrated um, those mind and world um, and, wor and world in the form of, of affect, of, of, of bodily feeling. And so he brought at the attention of the mind back to the, he calls them the affections of the body, the, the, the bodily emotions. Um, yes. and, so, and so for Spinoza, what the, the, the purpose of human life is to, is to cultivate these, these affects. Mm -hmm. um, and so we can get into, into, into all of this, but, but, but for, for, for Spinoza, the affects are the will. They're, yeah. so, so the will isn't the mind, it's not what we choose to do. The will is how we feel because it's what motivates us to do things. And so I'm getting around to your, your question with music here, which is that, um, so, so, so our task as, as human beings is to choose, we have the freedom of mind to choose at which level, at which register to express these affects, to express these emotions. So mm -hmm. what rock and roll did is it, it, it allowed us, it allowed us access to this whole domain of reality that had been repressed. And, you know, Freud called it, you know, the return of the repressed. It's the, the things that, that are oppressed come back with you know, an avenging force. <laughs> um, and so, and so that's, 
um, it's it's often been said that that the repressions the um, of of bodily knowledge of, of affective knowledge um, and somatic epistemology is its epistemology is ways of knowing um, somatic is bodily um, in the in you know in the wake of the enlightenment that it returned as as the crises of the of the world wars um, as a as a sort of um, Dionysian orgy of mass death and destruction basically um, mm -hmm. and so that that but then as a compensatory reaction to that we had the emergence of the counterculture um, in the in the 50s and 60s uh, not you know with rock and roll but also with beat poetry and uh, you know all the various movements um, and so I would say that um, you know I think what we've learned from rock and roll in the ensuing decades is that uh, and and from the, the other things that have come out of rock and roll or, or run parallel to rock and roll like rap and hip hop and electronic music and um, is that is that one can go too far into into the pure privileging of affect and I, and then then it becomes a mere reversal where you're where you're repressing rational thought in favor of of feeling and so I think this is what Elvis did and this is you know Elvis. Um, everyone watched him sort of degenerate tragically and um, uh, was, he was just on, on pills and, and almost incoherent and just this sort of sad, sad figure um, who we sort of watched slowly, slowly die. Um, right. And so, and so I think that's, so it's, it, I think that's, you know, and then, in, and then maybe in like the seventies and eighties, it reached this peak of, of, uh, of excess. Um, with the you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and, and I th so I think we've realized that 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 going too far into it was maybe a necessary compensatory reaction, uh, compensated for the previous privileging of rationality, and I think we've now gotten to a point um, mm -hmm. where where that's a, that's a, that's a generation ago or two even <laughs> that that these we people went to these extremes and and some people of course some people are still going to these extremes a figure like post malone or something like that who i i, I really like his music but he's uh i that he just i think he does too many too many drugs that fellow <laughs> um <laughs> which you know of course drugs you know uh um allow one to access um domain you know bodily knowledge um that that uh, one can and i mean this goes back to mercea eliad the, the the theorist of shamanism who um the it's this book is shamanism and the subtitle is the uh, um what is it archaic techniques of ecstasy so it's not just hmm. it's not just drugs it's it's um it's um, it's whatever uh, gets you there it's yeah it's dance it's breathing it's vocalization yeah. it's wilderness isolation fasting um it's yes. it's push, pushing your mind and body to extremes to create something new or to discover some new mode of feeling or thinking yes well i mean i'm tremendously interested in you know the numinous uh, experience however it's generated and uh, you know as somebody who is um has been music obsessed for you know almost my in entire life you know obviously it seems obvious to me that there's something uh extremely special about it and something very mysterious about it and you know uh, and i love exploring it and i um i understand that you know we i want to get to the spinozan a discussion and i see this this first part of it as a as a bridge there because i have the same kinds of questions in, in both topics and um and so i'll ask you one more music related question and we'll use that as a springboard to get into the you know into the spinozan question questions um and it's the same struggle that i have when i when i try to comprehend spinoza who i'll admit up front confuses me Mm -hmm. um and, and his popularity confuses me um and, and maybe you'll help me to understand that but let let me ask you an experience i had with uh with miles davis um mm -hmm. i i mean i adored the music of of miles davis and and have for a really long time and then i made the mistake of of reading his autobiography um and and i was shocked to see and to you know to hear from a person who just was like uh this 
a womanizer and you know had very aggressive um nasty sentiments about a lot of people and you know an incredible ego and like and i was i was actually i had i had a repulsion like i i couldn't believe it it was the same man who created all this sensitive in you know beautiful intense music i mean how could it be the same person you know and so mm -hmm. i and i still listen to it by the way you know you know but i struggle like you know who is the real miles davis and um what do you think is going on? Um, yes, he's expressing emotions. Some of them good, some of them bad. Does it does it matter? You know, is it just a simple expression of any affect of any feeling that that we we just need to get it out, whatever it is? Or or yeah. I would say it like this: Is there any moral culpability in music or emotion? Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, I love Miles Davis too. Um, uh, you know, I've spent, a, you know, quite a while listening to Kind of Blue over and over again, and a few of his other records. Um, I, you know, I actually had a similar experience with Bob Dylan when I was first getting into him in my twenties, uh, early twenties, or maybe even late teens. Um, and I watched the the film Don't Look Back. And okay. didn't see it. Um, yeah, uh, you know, and, and so this is this is his tour. Um, that he did of of the UK, I think in 1960, it's either 65 or 66, um, right around when Bringing It All Back Home was released. Um, and um, he had been dating Joan Baez. And so she's there on the tour with him. Um, but they, they seem to already have broken up. And he was just being really, really cruel to Joan Baez. And I mean, you know, in retrospect, they were both in their early 20s. Um, which is not known as a time for, you know, for when one is, has mastered one's, you know, one's, uh, uh, oneself. Emotional world. Um, yeah. 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 Emotional world. Um, but, but so, so that really, that really uh, gave me pause about Bob Dylan. And, and, and then as I, I, I went through his work, I mean, he, he, he did a similar thing with his wife, Sarah in the mid seventies where he was, when they were in the process of getting divorced during his um, Rolling Thunder review tour, he was, he was very cruel to her. Um, and, you know, what I think it comes down to is that, is that um, musicians, they're not, they're not moral leaders. I mean, they, I think that's not their function. Um, I think, I think their function is to, is to create great music and, um, I mean, you look at the Rolling Stones. I mean, they literally, I love the Rolling Stones. I mean, they're, they're incredible, but, but they literally s s sort of imply or even state explicitly that, that they're, they're um, you know, sort of products of the devil. <laughs> that, that they're, that they're, 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 at least they're on one album. The yeah. Devil. yeah. I mean, you know, I think someone asked Mick Jagger, uh, do you believe in God? Um, and do you think you're inspired by God? And and Jagger said, I don't think you've been really paying attention to what to what we're doing here. This is, we're expressing all of these, you know, these sort of Dionysian underworld um, 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 impulses, um, affects. So so I, you know, I think I think that you know, it's it's useful to think um, in terms of. Uh, um, uh, a plurality of 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 potencies of forces and powers um, that I mean this is this is this is something that might that might be getting a little too too um, too complex but there there for instance Gilles Deleuze who's who's probably my favorite philosopher at this point the French philosopher from the you know came out in the fifties and sixties um, he he did more than anyone else to to move thought away from this this sort of monocentric mode of thought um, and really inherited from Kant, which um, sort of united the the starry sky above me and the moral law within me. That's that's Kant. Mm -hmm. Those are those are the two things that he affirms that there's this objective, transcendent, unified truth, um, and. Um, you know, a lot of people have brought that into question, but but I think um, Deleuze, what he what he really does without without you know completely re rejecting um, monotheism, um, I think what he does is he 
is he looks at he, he has a thing called the dissolved ego because the the ego is was forged has been forged and this is this is from freud and, and Jung. the ego has been forged in in they call it it's biunivocal but it's it's in relation to monocentric divinity um and that that these two that the transcendent and the imminent mirror one another in this mm -hmm. um relation of bi is you know dual and then univocal is one voice. So it's one mm -hmm. voice expressed in, a, in its, you know, its transcendent aspect and its imminent aspect. And so- <clears throat> That's very Kabbalistic, by the way. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Um, so so, so this, is, this is sort of the movement that I'm actually tracing in, in my new book, which is Integration and Difference, um, from this, this dualism. Um, and I think, I think this is perhaps, or at least for me, it's the central, um, concern of, of philosophy since the pre-Socratic, since Heraclitus and Plato, is this dualism um, and the, the dialectic of basically what to do about the, you know, sort of opposed modes of thought or these oppositions or conflicts. Um, and so, so there's, this, there's this whole history that can be traced um, through through um, Hegel, for instance, in the in you know who came out with the phenomenology of spirit in the early 19th century in 1807, um, where he has it's this, the dialectic is um, he actually says he, he the, the the sort of classic formulation of it that he sort of eschews rejects is thesis antithesis and synthesis. So you have right. something that transforms into its opposite and those things exist in tense relation and out of that emerges a new um, unity and wholeness. Mm -hmm. And so, so that was sort of the dominant, the dominant philosophical mode in the 19th century. I mean, he was the, probably the most influential philosopher um, in the 19th century other than, I mean, perhaps Marx and Nietzsche was very influential in the, in the 20th century. Um, but then everyone was reacting against Hegel um, beginning with Nietzsche and Schelling in the late 19th century and then into the 20th century with, um, you know, especially with post-structuralism, Derrida and Foucault and Deleuze. Um, and so what they're trying to do, what, you know, especially Deleuze is trying to do is, um, is, is go beyond this, this, this dualism and envision reality as more of a more of a multiplicity, a pluralism in which there are lots of different nodes and centers all in relation to one another. Um, and so this has been, you know, expressed by a lot of different people in a lot of different ways. Um, but we were talking about music and I'm not really sure what, <laughs> there, what, what, what I wanted to say about it when I began that whole digression. <clears throat> That's okay. It's all part of one, <laughs> one holistic thing. Um, well, let's, Let's refocus it like that. We were we were talking about the connection, you know, about uh, affect, you know, the emotions in music, mm -hmm. whether or not they have what they're good or bad, you know, mm -hmm. whether the 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 simple revelation of an emotion is is it a neutral thing? Is it a positive thing? You know, um, and well, let, let's swing it over to Spinoza now. Mm -hmm. um, he says, as you said earlier, that that the will and the emotions are the same, mm -hmm. and if I understand him correctly, we cannot control our emotions. Those are some things that just happen to us. <clears throat> but what we can choose is to direct or to, you know, to react to the emotion and to direct it in a positive or a negative fashion. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's to, to, cho to choose it which, which register <clears throat> to express, express emotions, whether at, in an active way that cultivates joy or in a reactive way that tends toward Toward, toward sad affects. Okay. That obviously implies a degree of free will, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, whether or not you can control well, your emotions, you, so, you can okay. control, you can choose what to do with them. Is that so not a choice? Use, we, well, but we usually think of, in the sense that we usually think of free will as something that you can choose to do with your mind. But for Spinoza, the will and the emotions are the same. So we, so he says <clears> even God doesn't have free will, but God is also not <clears throat> subject to fate. So there's this there's this paradoxical area between de determinism and freedom. So 
So what we have is we have freedom of mind. We have the freedom to, to attend to our, um, our emotions and to choose at which register to express those emotions. So for instance, if we, if we feel anger, we can choose to um, strike someone or to yell at someone, or we can write a, write a, a, an angry song. We can write, you know, a heavy metal song or something, um, <laughs> or, or work towards social justice, or go for a run, or make a, you know, make the winning touchdown. That so we can we can. Th I think of them as 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 waves of affect that we can shoot that we can ride like surfers. And whether I'm right here by a surf break actually, um, and 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 we can choose, um, we can choose to skillfully ride these waves of affect or to be uh, tumbled by them and and you know perhaps even even drowned if if we let if we if we relate to them in a reactive way and we let them possess us mm -hmm. um, that can be very destructive but if we um, we we choose to express them in a higher register that can be extremely creative and generative so th we can't we can't we have to express these emotions that we feel one way or another um, even if we're turning them internally, even if our choice is to, to take this anger and pretend like everything's fine and turn it inward, um, it'll come out one way or another as, as passive aggression or as, you know, addiction or depression or some kind of destructive behavior. But just, just to, I get, I, I understand that and that makes sense. Just, mm. just to, for my own clarity, he is saying because you used the word choice a couple of times, like mm -hmm. that, that there is an actual free will decision to be made of what to do with your emotions, whether to but, ride but, this wave or to ride this but, wave. But, but you're defining will in a different way than spin. It's just it's just a definition. It's just a definitional issue because um, the will are emotions. So we get, we have the freedom of mind to to choose, but we can't choose what we will our will is what we feel and that's what motivates us so in the conventional sense of the term of free will we you might say that we have free will but in in spinoza's specific way of formulating this um mm -hmm. we don't have we don't have free will because the will isn't what we think it's not what we choose the will is how we oh. feel so the yeah. will is not free no, the it will is not. <laughs> the will is not free. The emotions are not free, and even even the seemingly the choice to ride the wave is not free because they're overwhelmed by your emotions, which is just compelling you in this one way or another. Well, you can't control the wave, but you can control you can control through your conscious choice through through your, through the choices that your mind makes. I mean, there's there's this classic, um, you know, classic duality between mind and heart, and or mind and body, and so the yeah. waves. The, we can't control the waves. Um, yes. The the waves are going to happen one way or another, and we can choose. We can choose how to relate to those waves, um, and at which. And that's a free. That's a free will choice. It's it's not a free. I, 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 a, I, I don't know. The, it's a. I don't know what other word to use except for will. You know, it's, it's, a, a, it's a free it's choice. A free, it's a. It's a free choice. It's a free choice. It's a. It's a freedom of mind, not of the will. Uh, okay. Fine. Fine, so, an intellectual choice versus exactly, an emotional yeah. choice. Right. Okay, but that's right. real. That's real choice. It, exactly. At, at the end of yeah. the day. Yes. Okay. Okay, good. Yes. Thank, thank so you. We do, that, we do have choice. We're not completely determined. We're not just robots acting out, uh, you know, some pre-given script in a pre completely predetermined universe. Although, okay. So, uh, yeah, a lot of Spinoza scholars do interpret him in that way, and this is this is uh, an, a, a, you know this is a different interpretation. So he's still subject to a lot of controversy. I'm sure. I I'm sure they're all. <laughs> well, it's interesting. The, the Talmud says uh, uh -huh. the Talmud says that a person who has a blood lust should uh -huh. either uh, become a, a warrior or should become a moel, you know, a person who performs circumcisions. In other words, <laughs> the, the blood lust exists. And you can't seemingly change that, but you channel yeah. it into something that's productive, you know, for society and for yourself. Exactly, um, that's Spinoza right there. Okay, good. So, so <laughs> I, I'm I'm not in as much disagreement as I was when we first started speaking. Um, yeah.
But let's the, let's let me ask you this: the the the, the golden rule, mm -hmm. um, you know, it comes from the heart of the book of Leviticus. You know, uh, love your fellow as yourself, mm -hmm. essentially. And there's many different. Every religion has some version of that. Um, mm -hmm. So that commands an emotion. Mm -hmm. You should, you must love your fellow as yourself. Would would mm -hmm. Spinoza look at that and be like, well, sorry. It, there is no control over love is an emotion and you, you, you wouldn't be able to perform that commandment. Um, I think it, I think it depends on how you interpret that passage, because for instance, um, I, I, I'm not exactly sure what Spinoza would say about that, but I know that Deleuze, who is probably, um, Gilles Deleuze, probably Spinoza's most noted um, 20th century follower and de devotee. Um, he, he says in an early text in the 50s, actually it's, a, it's his first series of recorded lectures called What is Grounding, um, that, that love is not a feeling, it's a, it's a commitment to an open-ended devotion. Um, that it's, that it's, it's um, it, it, because we, we all know that, that, this, that the, feeling of, the feeling of love doesn't sustain over, over doesn't sustain devotion over decades. One has to make a conscious choice to com continue to reaffirm that and to cultivate that emotion. Um, so the emotions associated with love. So I, I mean, I with think- Some relations that, more than others. With children, I think it's much simpler, just like it's very present. Maybe with um, maybe with more romantic love, it's, it's like that, it seems to me, but okay, uh, I hear what you're saying. Uh, um, so, so I mean, I think it's very ethical in that sense. It's, 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 uh, to me, I mean, that's that would be my interpretation of the golden rule. It's, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I, I, I mean, this is, I mean, you're, you know, a lot more about Jewish ethics than I do, but um, that's that's my understanding of, of, of Jewish ethics is that it's, it's not really that the innovation of uh, one of the innovations of Christianity is, is, or just the differences in Christianity is to focus more on how you feel internally. Whereas Jewish ethics has more to do with, um, it doesn't really matter how you feel as long as you, as, as you obey the commandments and you act, and you do right actions. That's, that's the, as, to me, that's the essence of, of Jewish ethics is, is, to, is uh, to act in a, in a way in accordance with the law. I think the vast, I think you're correct in, in the vast weight of, of the commandments are exactly as you say, mm -hmm. there's a, there's a small number that, mm -hmm. that actually do mandate emotionality. Um, one is uh, the, the need to love God, the need to love mm -hmm. people. Yes. It also includes doing specific actions, uh, for them, but they're, oh, and actually on, um, we just finished the holiday cycle, you know, uh, in the Jewish calendar. And uh, there's a specific commandment to be happy on on the holidays. Um, so, in in the Jewish way of thinking, you would have to do something to generate that emotion. Like if you weren't feeling it, you would have to do actions to, or or think thoughts that would bring you to a state of happiness because that's what's required in this particular moment. Um, and actually, to tell you the truth, is that there, there's a time in the year where you're supposed to reduce your level of happiness because uh, in commemoration of certain tragedies that took place. So there is a sense that you can, to some extent, you know, um, by, by doing external things, control your level of emotion, um, which I, I don't know, I, I guess would, would be different from Spinoza's view on it, but that's okay. Um, um, actually, well, it's, it's a little more complex than that because, I mean, first of all, um, you know, um, Spinoza, uh, grew up in the Jewish community in Amsterdam and they, they expelled him from that community. Um, for, no one's exactly sure why. Um, but one of the things is that he, he, he thought of God in a pantheistic way. So God is, is one with the world, is one with the universe. Um, but there's, so, so this is what, you know, Leibniz, who is, um, Spinoza's contemporary, and they they hung out for a couple of days in the late 17th century. And um, Leibniz was one of the guys who uh, invented the calculus, along with Newton and um, great philosopher as well. Um, but he said that that Spinoza's 
a philosophy as strange and full of paradoxes, even though he deeply admired it. And this is one thing that, that Spinoza says is that, I mean, most of the ethics, this great work that was published after his death is devoted to um, understanding how to actively cultivate positive affect. So, mm -hmm. so it's, so you can attend, so this is almost exactly what you're, you were saying is that you can attend to good things um, to cultivate joyful affects. Um, so it's this, it's this paradoxical situation where we can't choose which affects to, um, that determine us, but we can cultivate we can cultivate those affects in ourselves by, by sort of, you know, bending that in the same way we can't, we can't, we can't decide if you can't command the wave to occur at this moment. You can't right. say, you know, wave, you must now go. Uh, you, you have to wait for the wave, but you can position yourself in relation to yeah. the wave. You can, you can sure. be in the right spot Harness to it. the wave or to get drowned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. drowned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. Let let you mentioned before uh, pantheism, which obviously is um, uh, it's a con I find it to be a, a confusing topic. <laughs> Maybe you can mm -hmm. en enlighten me better on it. But it it often seems to me when I think about it and when I read about Spinoza's take on it, he says many things that seem transcendental to me, mm -hmm. despite the assertion that the universe is all there is and that the universe is co-equal to God. He, mm -hmm. he talks about like a, you know, divine thought, for instance, you know, where is the divine thought occurring? Is it, is it part of the, the universe itself? Um, it, it almost seems like he substituted one kind of transcendence for another, whereas panentheism, you know, monotheism would, would say that, uh, that God is, you know, within the universe and also beyond the universe, you know, mm -hmm. and so therefore when we talk about metaphysic, metaphysical things, spiritual things, those are beyond the physical world. Um, you know, is he not just doing a version of that um, by ascribing certain characteristics to the universe? Okay, so, so first of all, I think it's, it's important to distinguish between transcendent and transcendental. Um, okay. Because the transcendent is the idea that that there there's a, there are two worlds that there's a, there's a higher world that's the transcendent domain and then there's the imminent world that's that this world here. So that higher world, um, bef you know, it's it could be the the world of of heaven, um, or it could be the world of the Platonic forms. Forms, right? Um, that that everything is a copy of, um, and that and that world is more real than 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 this imminent world that we inhabit. Um, so for Spinoza, he, he basically is, um, affirms uh, pure eminence, which is, which is Deleuze's description of this. And so this, this is again a paradox because the, the, the very concept of eminence of this world um, is, uh, can, that, that concept only works in relation to something that it's transcendent to. Um, but the concept of the transcend transcendental, which is from Kant, um, and then and then a lot of people have taken it up. To, um, you know, for Kant, it's transcendental idealism, and then for for Deleuze, he has this thing called transcendental empiricism, which is very this very paradoxical formulation. Um, but it's it's the idea that that there's there's that our experience of reality. Um, is bounded by a, a horizon, but that horizon um, isn't, it's not a fixed line beyond which another a wholly other world subsists, exists. It's mm -hmm. that it's just like the horizon we, when you look out toward the ocean, you know that, that, that it's the same world beyond that horizon, but, but it's indiscernible. So it's knowable, it's cognizable by the mind. The mind can know that there's there's something beyond that horizon, um, but but you can't you can't see it. And so so this is this is a, a figure for our our consciousness. Our consciousness is is that horizon. And you know what you know one way of expressing the purpose of philosophy is that we are constructing 
more and more subtle um, and profound ways of pushing back that horizon and exploring the domains beyond that horizon. So, so for, for Spinoza, um, for Spinoza, there's, there's no other domain where, where the divine resides, that the divine permeates every, every point of our, of our being and our experience. And that, um, you know, God, God for Spinoza, I mean, I mean, I'm not sure I agree with him about this, but this is what he thinks. <laughs> um, right. That God, that God, you know, my, but we could get into my, my, my views on this at some point, but, <laughs> um, but, uh, but you know, for, for, for Spinoza, God um, doesn't have free will, but he's also not um, determined by fate. So it's, it's this paradoxical situation where, where God is the cause, God is the cause of all things um, through through the affects and we are expressions of of that will that that informs the world and god as much as it informs us okay that your <laughs> description of it is clear um although i find you know his formulation if i'm understanding it to be confusing you describe it as paradoxical you know like i i, I often wonder where the line between paradoxical and nonsensical, you know, exists. Um, but, but I don't know. And I don't know, I'm not informed enough about it yet to, um, to, to make my own determination. I just have like a sort of like a sensibility about it. But um, let me ask you one more, because we're running out of time, I see. But let me ask you one more question on this topic. Mm -hmm. If it could be shown and obviously uh, Spinoza was was not the beneficiary of uh, modern physics and cosmology. You know, um, right now we have something called the standard model of cosmology, <clears throat> which suggests that the universe had a beginning, which also further suggests, I would I would say that, you know, infers that there was something before the beginning um, and therefore that the universe is is not all that exists. Which makes mm -hmm. some has made in the past some physicists uncomfortable. It made uh, Einstein uncomfortable, you know. Um, so if if that could be shown, if if the universe is not finite, does does pantheism and the, and does Spinoza fail? Um, you know, I I think I think um, thinking in terms of of proving a claim in philosophy true or false is kind of beside the point. Um, okay. th that's, that's more, that's more the province of, of empirical science and mathematics, um, that, and, and so, you know, analytic, there's this divide in philosophy between analytic philosophy and continental philosophy and analytic philosophy really takes, um, takes science and mathematics as its primary model. And it, it tends to have two opposed opposed theories and they, they engage in logical combat and one is emerges triumphant and the other is vanquished. Um, continental philosophy, which is not, it's analytic philosophy is dominant in American and English philosophy departments, but continental philosophy is, is, is what we call theory. And it's, it's very dominant in the humanities and social sciences outside of the domain of philosophy. And it tends to be these French thinkers, you know, Derrida, Foucault, Deleuze, et cetera. Um, but, um, so let me see. I forgot where I was going with it. Uh, the, the finite nature of the universe. If, if, it, if the universe is finite, is, is Spinoza incorrect uh, with his pantheistic ideas? Okay. So, so I mean, so I, I think that the, the thing about Spinoza, which you, you sort of gestured toward, is why is he so, why is he still red? Why is he so mysterious and difficult and paradoxical? And is he just, is he just merely, is it just merely confusion? Um, and I think I think the test of that is is whether people are still reading him several several centuries later. That there's this there's this profound depth um, that 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 provides um, endless material for interpretation and explication and for debate. Um, and uh, you know this is this is a this is sort of some this is a, a a charge that's leveled at 
at a lot of 20th century philosophers too, from you know Heidegger to to these 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 French post-structuralists that we've been discussing, that they're just they're they're just merely incomprehensible. I don't think that's true at all. But I think what they're doing is they're especially especially Deleuze is he defines philosophy as the creation of creation of concepts. It's not it's not about it's not about staking out this limited or this this domain and saying this is truth and defining that truth against all rival claimants. It's mm-hmm. the, the purpose of philosophy is to to create new modes of language, to delve more subtly into the nuances and interstices in I mean, this is what Derrida is so great about, is that he he looks at our worldview, our mode of thought, and he looks at the places if you where if you push certain certain concepts that appear to be common sense deep enough, you see where they start to break down and where they start to become paradoxical. Um, and so the purpose of philosophy is to go into those places where our our sort of common sense collective mode of thought breaks down and to to push it farther to create concepts to to allow us to enter into those domains and to think in new ways that we've only intimated you know in in terms of our our affective you know intuition of what's what what is possible that hasn't been expressed in actuality that hasn't been expressed in uh in words. Well, that was very well said and yeah. also a great discussion. Um, <laughs> and um, if uh, next time I'm in the Virgin Islands, can we go see some music together? Absolutely. I, I play in a band, so we, you can come jam with us if you want. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. I don't find myself there very often, but uh, if I do, you're the first call I'm going to make. But uh, thank you great. so much for your time for your writing. Thank you for being here. There's an article coming out on H.com actually next week that uh, that Dr. Maxwell has uh, written along with some other articles on Spinoza. Um, please take a moment to, uh, to subscribe to our YouTube channel and stay abreast of all the great stuff that we have happening here at H.com. Thank you again for being here and have a great day. Yeah, thank you for having me. Take care. Bye all.